Right, so in this module, we're going to start by talking about circular motion, and then we're going to connect those ideas to universal gravitation, including orbit. But before we get into that, a quick reminder about what acceleration is in the first place. You've done a lot of F equals MA, and it can get kind of easy to forget what acceleration even is at the base level. All it is is a change in velocity. Now remember that velocity is both speed and direction. So example one, I've got acceleration in the same direction as my velocity, I speed up. All right, that's an acceleration. Uh, or if I slow down, that's a change in velocity, and it's caused by acceleration in the opposite direction. There's a third option, and that is if I turn, then I'll have some component of acceleration at 90 degrees to my velocity, uh, and that's also an acceleration. Even if I don't change speed, if I change direction, because velocity is a vector with both speed and direction, I have changed velocity. So that's an acceleration. So, when we travel in a circle and when we get that sort of acceleration at 90 degrees causing a turn, uh, there's a little thing called an object's period. And that is the amount of time it takes one, uh, to complete one trip around the circle. Because it's just this special notion of time, it has the same SI units as all our other time values, which is seconds. Now, a term that people often confuse with period is the frequency. That's how many trips around the circle it completes in one second. That'll be in units of hertz, or one over seconds. This can get confusing, so read the problem very carefully and understand if you're given the amount of time for one circle trip or the amount of one circle trips what, the amount of one circle trips, that doesn't even make sense. The amount of circle trips in one second. There it is. Because those are two completely different things. In fact, they're so different, they are inverses of each other. So I can always find, if I've given the period, I can find the frequency, uh, period is one over frequency, or frequency is one over the period. But they are complete inverses of each other, so be very, very careful as you read your questions as to whether you're given frequency or period. Ah, and then there's a special type of velocity called angular velocity. This is simply just the rate at which something travels around a circle. You're used to velocity being a change in distance over time. Well, now that I'm traveling in a circle, I've got some sort of middle point, and I'm going to be traveling around it, keeping the same distance from it, until I get to a full 360 degrees. But as I travel, I'm changing my angle relative to that central point. And that angle is defined as theta. So whereas regular velocity is change in distance over time, angular velocity is change in theta over time, where theta is measured in radians. Now every circle has two pi radians. That's the same thing as 360 degrees. And the amount of time that I take to complete a circle is called a period. So if my change in theta is 2 pi, and my change in time is 1 period, generally I'll find the angular velocity with this equation right here, 2 pi over t. Now if I'm given the frequency instead of the period, since period and frequency are inverses of each other, I can also just write this as 2 pi f. Now there's another type of velocity when you're traveling in a circle. It's not just how much of an angle do you cover. We also care about how fast you're actually moving. And that's the good old meters per second that you're used to. That's called the linear or tangential velocity. So it's just, yeah, distance over time. Now, when I travel in a circle, if I complete one full circle, that full circle is called a circumference. And I know from geometry class that the equation for circumference is 2 pi r, where r is the radius of the circle. Okay, so if linear velocity is how fast I'm traveling, distance over time, well, I'm traveling a distance of 2 pi r meters around the circle over the course of one period if I'm completing one circle. So that means my velocity can be described as 2 pi r over t or 2 pi r f. Now notice how very similar this equation looks to my angular velocity equation. Wow, since omega equals 2 pi over t and v equals 2 pi r over t, well, I can take my velocity equation, rewrite it as simply 2 pi over t all times r, and then replace this 2 pi over t with omega. 
because that's what it is. So I end up with V equals omega R, where R is the radius of revolution. So this means I can have, let's say I've got two objects attached to a string, and that string is just going at a regular rate around a circle. That means both of these objects have completed two pi radians in the same amount of time. Their angular velocity is the same, but the outside object had a greater distance to travel, so its circumference is bigger. That means it had a greater linear velocity. So an object on the outside might move faster than an object on the inside, assuming that they've got the same angular velocity. Um, we'll find that that's not the case with orbit. The planets do not have the same angular velocity, and in fact, you move closer the f or faster the closer in you are. But we're just comparing straight up raw angular velocity to linear velocity right now. And you'll find that a lot of your same equations will hold. In fact, the position equation, the velocity equation, and the combo equation are all still valid, but now I can just replace every variable with its angular equivalent. If I'm interested in uh, how many radians it's covered in a certain amount of time, or if I'm interested in how fast it's moving after a certain amount of time, or something like that. Um, this also incorporates angular acceleration, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, when I'm actually when I'm forcing something to travel in a circle, I need to be, surprise, surprise, exerting a force on it. Nothing's going to travel in a circle unless there's a force causing that to happen. Um, think about Newton's first law. An object will move, uh, an object in motion stays in the same motion unless acted on by an outside force. Well, if I'm turning, that's not the same motion. There's got to be a force causing that. So, Newton's first law is often called the law of inertia. Inertia is just an object's tendency to keep doing what it's already doing. Um, so I've got to have some sort of force and some sort of acceleration. In this case, it's always going to point toward the center of the circle. Imagine this. Let's say you and your cousin, uh, you got a little cousin, you're out at a park, and you grab the cousin's arms and you start swinging them in a circle. And their legs fly out uh, away from you and they're almost horizontal, and they're squealing, and everyone's having a great time. Here's what an overhead view of that might look like. Man, that's a horrible drawing. But there you are in the middle, and your cousin is flying outward as you travel in a circle like this. Now, at each point in the circle, the only reason your cousin isn't flying to the outside is simply because your arms are pulling, and you're pulling with a force. So when, you're, uh, when your cousin is here, you're pulling in this direction. When your cousin's off to the left, you're pulling in the rightward direction. When your cousin's down below, you're pulling this way. And when your cousin's off to the right, you're pulling in the leftward direction. So your pull, your force, always is pointing toward the center of the circle. That's the direction the, equa uh, the acceleration goes as well. And an equation for that acceleration is just going to be v squared over r. Now, you could write this several different ways because we know the relationship between v and omega, uh, but this is typically the way that I'll look at it. I'll take the linear velocity, square it, divide it by the radius. That'll give me the acceleration uh, that's causing this object to turn. So speaking of acceleration, if you remember from f equals ma, uh, anytime there's an acceleration, it's because there is a force. This force causing something to go into a circle is called the centripetal force, and it always points toward the center of the circle. And it's got to be caused by something, some sort of applied force. Um, the way I like to describe it is that centripetal force is not a brand new type of force. It's, uh, so you've got normal force, that's a certain type. You've got gravity, that's a certain type. You've got friction, that's a certain type. This is not a new type, like centripetal just doesn't go in that list. Instead, uh, centripetal force is a designation that's given to one of these other forces when these forces are causing something to go in a circle. Um, so the equation of the centripetal force, well, that'll just be mass times the centripetal acceleration because F is always ma. Uh, and in this case, the centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. So my centripetal or radial force is mV squared over R. Mass times velocity squared divided by radius. Nice. Now, I talked earlier about how the cousin's legs kind of fly up toward the outside of the circle. In fact, every time you go in a circle or you're being pulled in a circle, it feels like you're being pushed to the outside. 
That's what's called a centrifugal force or centrifugal force. But that force is fake. Totally fake. It's just an object's inertia that keeps it moving in a circle. So going back to the cousin, as your cousin travels in a circle, if you let go at any moment, that cousin will just travel in the direction that he or she was traveling right at the moment you decided to let go. So you fly to the outside of the circle, not because something forces you to the outside of the circle, just because you lose the force to the inside of the circle and therefore stop turning. Um, so you feel like you're being pushed to the outside just because your body always wants to go to the outside. Because um, Newton's first law, that's natural. But when there's something forcing it inside to the circle, that's, that's when you actually travel in a circle. So all the forces in circular motion point to the inside. Any outside forces, they're just imagined, just inertia. So we'll talk about some of these concepts when you all get back in class. And until then, have a brilliant, I don't know, morning, afternoon, night, five minutes before class starts. I don't know when you're watching this thing. Bye.